neighbors that also overthrew regimes during the Arab Spring. But its transition has still been tested by violence and social unrest, while the poverty, corruption and unemployment that first sparked the 2011 uprising have not gone away. Let's get more on events in Tunisia with our international affairs editor, Armin Georgian, who's here with us in the studio. Hi there, Armin. Good morning. Um, and now, first off, uh, these figures from the old regime that we were mentioning, uh, are they going to be making a big comeback? Well, they've already had a strong presence in these parliamentary elections. Of course, many of them lay low after the revolution and still have influence in some towns and cities. Uh, and also, remember that there's a presidential election next month and several former cabinet colleagues of the uh, ousted president Zinan Abedin Ben Ali are running in that election. Um, of course, it's not unusual for an old guard to come back. I mean, if you think of uh, Eastern Europe after 1989, communists changed their colours or their names and came back a few years later. In the Middle East, it's happened a lot. Some Ba'athists have come back to important positions in Iraq. Uh, and I, I think Egypt is perhaps the closest parallel in that sense to Tunisia. Uh, you have quite a few factors that are similar to, to Tunisia. Uh, you've got uh, a, a climate of uh, of instability, uh, security threats, uh, a worsening economy, and that has led to a kind of recreation of the uh, Mubarak era security apparatus because people have said, well, uh, you know, if the country do isn't doing so well, uh, we need law and order. And if the price to pay for that is some old regime figures have to come back, well, so be it. So that's been kind of a shrug. Uh, you know, people in, in both countries, I think, in a sense, have, uh, have responded in that way. And of course, in both countries, in Egypt and Tunisia, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, brand has been devalued, uh, particularly in, uh, in Egypt. So I think you've got a combination of factors that now now uh, leads people in Tunisia to say uh, we can accept a certain level of return of those figures from the Ben Ali regime. And let's talk about how the different political parties might be going to have to work together um, due to how the votes stacked up. Uh, we've seen Ennahda, the moderate Islamists, say that this, we are conceding defeat to the secularists, but they still got quite a strong showing themselves. Uh, how are these two going to be able to work together? Well, Inada, I think, uh, already showed a, a, a pretty uh, a hopeful uh, capacity for compromise last year, although they have been criticised a lot, of course, over the last few years. Uh, but after those two uh, political figures were... Uh, two opposition leaders were assassinated uh, last year that tipped Tunisia into a crisis and people thought maybe it could go the way of Libya or other Arab Spring, you know, post-Arab Spring spring countries, but actually the different political forces pulled together and a lot of that was down to Ennahda being uh, flexible enough to step down and agree to a transitional government and that of course has led to the situation today where these parliamentary elections uh, have been held. So they've already showed uh, a willingness to build consensus. Uh, I think uh, the concession of defeat has been relatively gracious. I believe it happened on Twitter through the daughter of Rashid Ganouchi, the leader of uh, Ennahda. And also uh, there's been a, a fairly, uh, I would say, um, cautious uh, tone from, uh, from the leader of Nida Tunis, the party that's come out in front, Beji Kaid Asebsi. So I think the, the whole kind of tone at the moment um, does still give one some hope that Tunisia can continue to be an exception in these Arab Spring transitions. Thanks very much. Armin Georgian, International Affairs Editor here at France 24. Now, Syrian rebels are reported to have launched a major assault on the government-held city of Idlib. It's seen as a bid to consolidate their control over the country's northwest. Fighters from the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Al-Nusra Front plus Islamist rebel units attacked the city from all sides from dawn on Monday. This is according to the main opposition monitoring group, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Thomas Waterhouse has more. Dawn in Idlib and the assault is underway. An array of Islamist militants and other rebels attack from all fronts in a huge coordinated offensive. Taking advantage of a power cut across the city, fighters mainly from the Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Nusra front shelled the government-held stronghold, while others targeted army checkpoints on the ground before infiltrating the city's streets. On their social media account, rebels listed their victories. 
claiming to have cut the supply route to the city, as well as briefly seizing the governor's office and police headquarters, allegedly killing dozens of government troops. Assad's forces eventually managed to repel the attack, with government sources saying a large number of terrorists had been killed. The Syrian Air Force took to the skies to carry out fresh airstrikes against the rebels, including barrel bomb drops. These pictures purport to show men from the Free Syrian Army using anti-aircraft guns against Assad's warplanes. Close to the border with Turkey and its arms supply routes, rebels here are certainly better equipped than their counterparts elsewhere in Syria. And the al-Nusra front in particular has made substantial gains in this region in recent months. Taking control of Idlib would be a symbolic and strategic win for them. The only other city not controlled by the government is Raqqa, and that's in the hands of the Islamic State organization. But late on Monday, State TV was reporting Idlib was fully back in government hands and that life was returning to normal. Well, in the north of Syria, as warplanes drop more planes on Kobani from the skies and Kurdish defenders fight on inside the city on the ground, there are calls for the fight against the Islamic State group to be taken online too. The militants are still trying to seize full control of the strategic Turkish border town after weeks of fighting. On Monday, coalition partners pledged to work harder to prevent the Islamic State group re recruiting foreigners, including on the web. The man in charge of the American... ...worthy of financial support that attracts and radicalizes foreign fighters. I believe every coalition partner, everyone, has a unique and a vital role to play in striking down this image. OK. Now, the Lebanese army says it's back in control in the country's second city after four days of intense violence that's left 42 people dead, more than 150 hurt and 162 arrested. The military launched the operation to root out militant extremists who'd brought fighting to its historic heart. This is the latest and most extreme example of the war in neighbouring Syria spilling across the border. We can get more with our correspondent Fernand Van Tetz, who's in Tripoli for us. Uh, Fernand, what's the situation in Tripoli right now? Fighting wrapping up around about 24 hours ago. Yeah, calm has returned to the streets of Tripoli. Uh, shops have started to reopen slowly, some residents even returning home, but the damage is incredible. I walked around both the Souks and Baba Tabana neighborhood where the fighting was most intense yesterday. The damage to the buildings is incredible.